Julie joins us out of India. Simon, welcome back, mate. Cheers, Marty. How are you, buddy? Well, you know, I don't actually feel that disappointed. I don't know about you, but I just felt like we were never really in that game that they were always better than us. Yeah, I kind of felt leading into it that uh, we had to be at our absolute best and they had to they had to falter a little bit and neither of those things happened. We were good and, you know, when you put in a, a chase of 327, when you're looking for 398, 70 runs might seem a, a very much a one-sided affair, but for parts of that game we were in it, uh, but very rarely with the ball were we in it, and I think that was the, the major concern. Okay, so how important was the toss, Then We've been talking about this. Would it have made any difference? And I'm painting scenarios like, look, if we had won the toss and batted first, we probably would have posted 300, and what that would have done to their mindset, maybe given us a chance to actually swing the ball a little bit because we couldn't get anything when in the hot sun in the afternoon. I don't know. It's all ifs and buts, isn't it? Yeah, they are ifs and buts, and look, I think it it might have made a small difference. But when it, when I look at this Indian side, they don't miss many places in that side. I mean, it is just a it is a very very good side. They cover all bases. They got, and all players come into this semi final pretty much in form. Um, you know, the only player that hadn't got a hundred for them in the top five was Shubman Gill. Um, others had got three. Rohit's got a couple now. Uh, Shreyas Iyer's got two. So they'd, they'd all been in terrific form leading into it. Surya Kumar hadn't had a lot of batting to do, so his uh, numbers weren't really a concern. And they had the best five bowlers as a as a pack in the tournament um, by a stretch. So they just had no, you know, no base uncovered, and and everything just looked it led towards an India victory. So. As I say, I, I don't know that it would have changed things dramatically as far as the result was concerned. It might have just been a little bit tighter. Talk about Shami, mate. I mean, because whatever our bowlers couldn't do, yeah. seven for 57, Dooley at five seven nines off 9.5. What an outstanding performance that was. And I know the batsmen, the Indian batsmen, are going to get all the plaudits, but that guy, without him, I mean, again, he, he took away any chance we had. Yeah, he was incredible. I mean, he has been throughout the tournament. Remembering that he missed the first two games uh they didn't select him and he came back and he went five four five in the first three games he played as far as wickets taken were concerned he's had one game only through the tournament where he hasn't picked up a wicket and he just he's been exceptional he's been the the difference maker they were looking for a, a, a not a bits and pieces cricket that's harsh on shuttle tackle but they were looking for that batting all-rounder when hardick uh, wasn't there, and even when Hardik was there, they were still looking for someone like Shardul to play so that they could have six bowling options. And the moment that Hardik went down injured, they, they basically decided to go to Shami and say, we're going to go with five bowlers, and if we have to use a Kohli or a Rohit Sharma or someone else, then we just have to do it, and we're going to bite the bullet and, and run with five only. And when you've got five absolute guns, uh, I think that's a, a great recipe for, for winning a World Cup, and he has been simply brilliant. Um, they've started well in most of the games with Bumra and Siraj, but you know there's just no respite with Mum and Shami when he comes into the attack. And again, last night, he just bowls wicket to wicket. He nips it one way or the other. He's not really bothered about which way it goes. He's just probably got the best seam presentation in world cricket. And I'm really pleased for him. He's a terrific bloke as well. So okay. that always helps. You know, I know that you love your history as well. I'm looking back at that windy side that went 75-79. That was just almost unbeatable. Then in 83, what an upset that was when India got them. And then you look at that Australian side, which was just awesome and smoked everyone in 03-07. Is this Indian side potentially as dominant? It's the best Indian side I've seen as a complete package with, with you know, as I say, with a bowling attack that there is just no weakness in. Uh, and a batting side that are, are very, very dominant at the moment. They won't go on a run because, you know, Virat won't play another World Cup. Uh, Rohit won't play another World Cup. Kale Rahul is, is maybe uh, in the same boat. Uh, so, you know, they're going to have the, the next generation are going to have to do the job for them. So that's why they probably won't be as dominant as far as World Cups are concerned. Um, but this, if they do win this one, I think it will give that next generation the, the confidence and the belief because there'll still be a few guys and, you know, the likes of Shubman Gill will, will sort of lead this side in the future. I think Shreyas Iyer has been brilliant. So they will lead the side in the future, but it just might give them a, a bit of confidence to do so. Okay. We're going to talk about South Africa, Australia in a second, but, but you know, can you see them losing? I mean, how do you, how do you beat them then if they are so complete? Uh, I think... 
I think South Africa can beat them if they bat first. That's about the only way. You, you have to put them under a pretty immense pressure, though. And by immense pressure, I think, you know, well in excess of 300. I don't think that that 280, 290, 300 will cut the mustard against this side. So that would be the only way I can see them getting beaten. Uh, the thing about Australia is that they they know how to win. They find yeah, a way. They know yeah. how to win these World yeah, Cups. You know, they had a terrible start to the tournament. And they just, they work it out. And, and they haven't played very well at all um, throughout the tournament. Their bowlers haven't been great. They've been saved on a few occasions by terrific innings, particularly the one from Maxwell against Afghanistan. So it, it's an interesting one. But um, I, from my point of view, I think South Africa are the side that can beat them if they bat first. Okay, well, that's tonight. Let's talk about that because I want to go back and ask you some more questions just about New Zealand's performance. But since we're on the topic, okay, Yarpies versus Oz tonight. And also, look, you know, it's it's the island at the Rugby World Cup. It's not the same group of players and everything. But that hangover just seems to be there if, if the team gets in trouble. Can you see South Africa being able to overcome the mental hurdle tonight? Only if they bat first. If they have to chase any score, uh, you know, in excess of that 270, 280, 290 mark, I just can't see it happening. Um, they have that mental block. I think they've, they've got a template that they play very well or use very well batting first, and it seems to free them up a little bit. Yeah. In a chasing situation, uh, they just don't seem to have that same freedom or that same mindset of, of how they want to play and I think if they bat first, they win. If they don't bat first, I think Australia will probably go through to the final. Are either of those sides, these sides on paper, better than India, or you just think that the conditions, the circumstances, the pressure of a final might favour either of them if it all if it all dominoes fall in the right place? Uh, neither of them are better than India. Uh, so Africa have got, a, I think, their top six can perform as well on any given day, I don't think they are necessarily better. They, they do have uh, some real, you know, some absolute class players. When you, when you think about Quentin de Kock and, um, you know, Frieza Hendricks plays class and Markram, Miller, they do have some really cl- high quality class players. They can perform at the same level on any given day, but I don't think they are better. Okay. Um, so that's where I would sit with, with their batting lineup and their bowlers are probably just one short uh, from from equaling a you know an Indian attack that I think has been the best through the tournament. Virat Kohli gets his fiftieth century, his fiftieth one day century last night. So Sashin had what fifty one Test centuries, forty nine ODIs, and so he overtakes that record. It's just mind boggling. Kane Williamson made a great quote in the post match presser, Dolly, where he says, "You know, playing fifty one day internationals for most players that's quite a milestone. <laughs> fifty <laughs> centuries, for God's sake." Yeah, and it's just the sheer numbers. He's only played 291 games, I think it is. And to have 50 centuries in 291 games, the strike rate, the average, everything about that is is just phenomenal. So, look, his, his numbers are – I think he averages anyone, – anyone else that averages over 50, uh, I think A.B. de Villiers is the next best who scored in that top, list of top 10 hundred getters – and AB's average is 53. No one else in that top 10 list of scoring hundreds and ODIs has an average in excess of 50. So it shows you how dominant he is and how good he is. And when you think about the number of games that he's done it in, it's just been next level crazy. Yeah. And to do it for him last night in front of Sachin, uh, you know, a place where India have won a World Cup, all of those things. And, you know, he was actually very, I think his celebration was very humble last night. Um, we haven't always seen that from Virat Kohli, but, you know, Sachin was in the stand. Um, it, it was a, a lovely bow to him. It was, it was a lot to like about what he did last night. And, um, you know, it was a, a great way to celebrate it. Yeah, you've been, at, you know, like me, you've been very lucky. You've been at sporting tournaments, world events and so forth. Sometimes you get a feeling, don't you, that there's just, you know, it's just the tide is coming and you can't fight against it. Does it feel like that with India here, with just being in that country, with the whole country behind it, with the fact that, you know, these guys, it could be their last World Cup? With all, do, 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 are you are you getting that? It's, it sort of feels like it's written in the stars sometimes, doesn't it? There's, yeah. There's that, that, that's sort of the history, the... the the players, all of those things that uh, you just, you do get the feeling. And, and whatever surface they play, I know there's some conjecture around the pitch and all those things, but whatever surface they play on, they have a side that can beat pretty much anyone. And 
when they're playing with this sort of confidence, it, it just seems like um, you know the country is almost destined, to, and if and they are going to have to have a pretty bad day or an off day not to win that final. Let's talk about that pitch then, because the switch pitch and the ICC have come out and said, "Oh, this was going on all tournament. Don't worry about it." You know. Do we need to make a deal out of this because it just seemed a little bit unusual, a bit untidy, and it's also seemed a bit unnecessary? Yeah, unnecessary was my call. Um, look, the ICC have towed the line. Uh, it, it hasn't been happening all tournament under their watch. They haven't known about it. Andy Atkinson, who's their um, pitch guru who does uh, all of that, he has come out and openly said, look, we didn't know um, that they'd been swapped. We were told after this one had been changed that that has happened once or twice already in the tournament, but he, that wasn't uh, under his supervision or he didn't know about it. So, look, they have appeased uh, the BCCI, which is what they do, and it was unnecessary in my opinion because Indy, if you play that game 10 times, Indy would win it eight, probably nine, with the sides that, that competed last night. Okay. And it doesn't matter what surface you play it on. They are just that good at the moment, and New Zealand are just not quite as good. And that's not a slight on New Zealand. This is a this is a very very um, outstanding Indian side, and, and I think if you, as I said, if you played it ten times, they, they win it eight, maybe nine. So Simon, season. what is the difference then? I mean, with your expert eye, what is the difference in playing it on that pitch and playing it on the pitch that they should have played it on? Uh, probably just a little more grass coverage. Um, ball might have slid on just a little more. They might have. I, I think the Indian bowlers. The seam bowlers in particular and it proved that last night are more used to those types of conditions where it's not got a lot of grass on it. So they just hit that length a little bit better than the New Zealand bowlers. It, it took the swing out of the game uh, if there was potentially going to be any swing. And I think what they were probably worried about was the second innings. Yeah. Um, if, if they did lose the toss, the second innings and when it had been dangerous. And that showed last night. So when you think about games that have been played at one kitty stadium, uh, Sri Lanka all out 55, um, sides being four down, five down inside that first 10, 15 overs. That, that's what they were taking out of the game. And, and I don't think it was bad for the game at all, to be honest, because it just showed you that New Zealand, they got themselves into a great position and didn't struggle all that much batting second, which sides have done through the tournament. We've seen very much one-sided games at that ground. And last night wasn't Although 70 runs might look it, it wasn't all that one-sided. Look, when you stack up these stats here, 724 runs scored, one guy gets a seven for, there are three centuries in the match. I, I mean, this says to me that's a yeah. pretty good bloody one-day wicket, doesn't it? How can you how can you complain about it? it? It wasn't a bad wicket at all, and they didn't change it to play on a bad wicket. I think they just tried to even the contest a little bit, almost realising that they were the best side. And evening the contest meant that it needed to play almost as well in the second innings as it did in the first, unlike the, the first three or four games at that venue. When you even think about Australia, what were they, seven for 90? Yeah. Something or seven, yeah. you know, uh, against Afghanistan. Yeah, and then Maxwell uh, uh, so, yeah. And then Maxwell went ballistic. So it wasn't like, you know, the, the previous games had been pretty difficult, incredibly difficult, actually, to bat second. So they just, I think they just even the playing field as far as batting first, batting second was yeah. concerned, and and I have no issue with that. A couple more questions to let you go. Thank you so much for your time, mate. Um, what could our bowlers, especially Trent and Tim, have done differently at the beginning? Because they seem to bowl a lot, and then Ferguson came in as well. I, you know, I call it spinning plates. You know, those plates on sticks. It's almost like the ball sat up. There was one where Sharma almost looked back at Bolt, going, "What the hell are you doing?" And then just rocked back and just clipped it straight over. It just, it just was a bit easy. Yeah, it was, I, and look. I don't know how much different they could have bowled, to be honest. They, they There was no swing, which New Zealand have relied heavily on. Uh, they're both probably just a little bit down on pace uh, from where they have been in their pomp, in their best, at their best. And, uh, you know, on good batting surfaces in the heat of the afternoon, don't underestimate how hot and human tough it is out there as well. Uh, Might have been just off off the mark a little bit as far as their lengths were concerned. But these guys come hard at you and they put you under pressure. And, and that's what they've done all tournament. You know, Tim, Trent, Lockie, they're not the only bowlers that have suffered at the hands of this batting lineup through the tournament. And because they put you under so much pressure, you, you, you may go searching in other areas, still looking for wickets, which is what New Zealand have to do. They, they couldn't afford to just try and bowl dots and sit back. They still had to search for wickets because if, you know, if Rohit didn't get you, Virat would or Shreyas would or, 
someone else would. So it, it, I don't know that they did the enormous amount wrong. Uh, a little disappointed with Lockie Ferguson through the tournament at times. I mean, he was carrying enough, he was still carrying that injury right through the tournament. He hasn't been at full pace. Um, you know, if you're looking at some of the things through the tournament, the selection policy at times um, wasn't great. Bowling first and two two occasions, one against South Africa, one against Australia, were, were really bad, bad decisions from um, from management. But you know, could they have done a lot differently? I don't think so. See, that's the thing. I mean, I'm looking down since '07, mate. You got 20 semi finalists. Well. We've, we're the only team that's made the semi-final in all five of the last one-day cricket World Cups. We've made five, India and Oz four, South Africa three, Sri Lanka two, and the Poms and the Packies one each. But, I mean, I'm just, you know, I was trying to convince Lachlan, I said, you know, he said, well, okay, sure, but, you know, we didn't win anything. But, I mean, you've been a former Black Cap yourself, mate. So, I mean, the fact that we're making these semi-finals, isn't that something to be enormously proud of? It's not a major sport here in New Zealand. It is our summer sport, but I'm just talking in terms of playing numbers and things. I keep thinking we overachieve every time we make the final four. Is that true? I, I think that's about our level. I, I really do. And, and, you know, are we a chance to win one? I mean, we, we should, probably should have won 19. That that was our yeah, time, yeah. I think. Um, you know, we were outplayed in, in Melbourne in 15. We were completely outplayed yesterday. Um, and we probably should have won 19. That was that was the one we, we probably let slip and got away with, with probably our best side that we've had uh, of the last 10, 15 years. That was our best side and our best opportunity. So... I, I, I'm not saying we overachieve. I think we we reach our level, and and semi-finals is probably a better level. We are one of the top three, four sides in the world, but we're not number one, number two. And you know, if sides play to their full potential against us in a semi-final, we're probably going to have to be at our absolute best to compete. And uh, and that is something to be enormously proud of. Yeah. We, we, okay. You know, I don't think we overachieve. I think we we sort of we achieve. We we get to about where we are, and we need to be at our absolute best to, to win those games when we get to those situations. Um, you know, we've got some very very good players in the side, but India are just a better team. You know, when you get 327, do you know that there's the other st- last that I'll leave you with. So there's only been three teams in a semi final at the World Cup that have hit 300. Aussie did it 359 and 03, and then last night with the other two. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. If you hit 300 in a semi final, yeah, you'd expect to win the bastard, wouldn't you? Well, that's that's the thing. And when you're chasing, you know, I, I, you're one of your earlier statements on sort of leading into the game, obviously we'll either get, you know, win by a little bit or we'll get absolutely trounced. Normally if a side gets 397, you know, it, it can be an absolute trouncing. But for a long period of that partnership with Kane and, and Daryl Mitchell, and, you know, word on, I mean, positives come out of the tournament. Daryl Mitchell, again, yeah. has just proven yeah. that in the last two to three years, he has been an absolute gun for New Zealand. I'd make him my white ball captain, mate. So I love him. Yeah, hell yeah. He's brilliant. Yeah, mate. absolutely. And, and Ratchin Ravindra, I mean, a massive bonus plus to come out of the tournament from a guy who probably wouldn't have played at the start of the tournament. Satner was brilliant throughout the tournament. Didn't have his best day yesterday, but... With the ball, he was he was brilliant throughout the tournament. So some some real positives to come out of it as well from, from New Zealand's point of view. So finally, who's the guy? There's some guy that was what looked like Sashin and some guy Beckham. Who were those two dudes you're standing with? Yeah, yeah, that's that. That was those two dudes. Um, just a couple of a couple of stars. You're the trivia it's question in the middle um, from now on, mate. That's it. Every time it's going to come up at a pub <laughs> quiz in New Zealand, who's the guy in the skinny jeans? That's Dooley, mate. That's Dooley. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, yeah. Well, it was royalty there yesterday, Marty. Mate. Not only those two, but uh, Bollywood stars, Bollywood actors, uh, actresses, you name it. They were all there yesterday. They all wanted a piece of it. How big a star are those guys like Sachin Tendulkar and that when they say, I mean, it just must be, mate, you must sit there and you, even you, I mean, I know yeah. you get to see this a lot. You've been to India a lot, but every, what, do your eyes just gape every time you do? Sachin's just incredible. I mean, you know, what he does, there is a bloke who never wants for anything in life. I mean, he he could live anywhere in the world and live a very quiet, calm life. Uh, but he chooses to stay in India to give back, to support charities, to still follow the game passionately, to still be involved with the Mumbai Indians franchise. You know, he still puts his training gear on him and sits in the dugout Go on. Uh, with the Mumbai Indians. And, and, and there's a bloke who could live in Monaco yeah, and, and yeah. live a very, very comfortable life if he wanted to do uh, anywhere in the world. But, uh, you know, he, he chooses this life. He chooses to give back. He chooses uh, the UNICEF, which he and David Beckham were there for yesterday. 
um, a, as a charity. So, you know, there's a lot to admire about him. Um, and it was, yeah, it was nice to see uh, David Beckham had never been to, to India. Um, he, it was his first trip, uh, obviously, with, with UNICEF, which is a, a charity he's supported since his very young age, his very young days at, at United. So, um, yeah, and I think he was pleasantly surprised with, with the game itself and, and with the atmosphere and everything in and around the stadium. He couldn't probably have picked a, a better day to do it. Awesome coverage for us, bro. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, mate. No worries at all, buddy.